Hey, listen, I want to give you congratulations, by the way. I need to congratulate you. Why do you need to congratulate me? Because you just got married. Yeah, I know. And I'm going to your wedding. big wedding celebration um, in a couple of weeks. I'm so excited. Are you really excited? It's in like two weeks. It's in two weeks. Um, but getting getting married is like, it's really quite hectic, the whole thing. I didn't think it was going to be that hectic. Planning it, organizing it, getting people oh there, God. everything. Yeah. It's stressful. It's really stressful. And and also what I've worked out is that I don't particularly do well with stress. How are you with stress? Not great. Really? Triggers my anxiety. Talk to me about that. How, why does it trigger it? Just it's just it just is something that it makes me it can make me feel a bit on edge. I actually think I cope with stress quite well in that I'm someone that quite often leaves important stuff to the last minute. Mm-hmm. And then the stress of it makes me super efficient. It makes me do it really well, but only at the very last moment. Yeah, that's 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 uh, that's probably a typical thing of um you might have a slight bit of ADHD. I well, I actually I was I did some uh, like a kind of mental health assessment recently. And I was like, right, what have I got? <laughs> you ready yeah, yeah, for the yeah. list? And they were literally like, <laughs> <laughs> actually, like I was like, I don't, I don't actually have ADHD, but I thought I might do. Do you have it? Yeah, I, I, I definitely do. Um, and and what I like, loads of things with it is that like uh, I can hyper focus into stuff, which sometimes yeah. isn't isn't very good. So for example, it can be really positive in terms of work, so I can hyper focus into yeah. work. But then I can hyper focus into like something like tinnitus. So if I have tinnitus okay. for like six years, so when it first started, all I could focus on was that. So it kind of works that. And also the other side of it is that um, I do everything last minute. Yeah. I, until I ha- until I have to. I haven't written my speech. <gasps> okay. Well, <laughs> that's probably going to be a stress reaction. You're going to do it really well, <laughs> like the night before. Oh my okay. god! It's Are you not get someone to help you? No, I got to do it myself. Okay, I'm just, no, I know it has to come from the heart, but like, just sit down with like one of your like best men or something, or and then like, write it. Yeah, I and be like, know. okay, I've got to do it. How long do you think we've known each other for? Um, okay, a long time, like way before Made in Chelsea. Way before Made in Chelsea. Way before, um, I think we we're about fourteen. I think we're younger, maybe fourteen. I think we're fourteen because you used to know one of my friends. I think you went to Radley with them. Yeah. And he, we lived in, I lived in the same village. Was that Joss? Yeah. Is that how we yeah. knew each other? Yeah, that's how we met. And I remember, I remember I used to, used to, you and Kagi used to come to um, our like sports day thing. Yeah. And um, I used to think we were the coolest <laughs> kids because we had these like smoking hot girls turning up at Bradley. And I was oh like, what up everybody? It was honestly, because it was an all boys school. And so when... Girls are right. It was honestly like catching a snitch. Honestly, it was like the rarest thing in the world. It was unbelievable. So we've known each other for a long time, right? right like longer than even than I've known. Yeah, like any of the other like Made in Chelsea cast. And like I said, I want to congratulate you because I, ever since I known you, we, you know, we've always kind of gone out, had fun, drank a lot, all those different things. And you are now eight months sober. Yeah. That is unbelievable. Hey, um... How do you feel about that? Has it changed everything? It's like, honestly, being the biggest game changer for my mental health. Really? Yeah. Like I feel, I'll be honest, Kate, it's, I'm not, I don't have zero anxiety, but I've got a lot, a lot less anxiety. I feel like I can cope with things a lot better. Mm-hmm. Um, like hangover, hangover free life is, it is really freeing. Yeah. Like I don't like to say like, oh, I'm, I'm sober. Like I just don't think it's a good representation of, of, how I feel like I, and I feel like that word is quite weighted you're just not drinking I just fr- I like to say I'm just like I just I'm alcohol free but talk to me about the anxiety right because I, I, I deal with it as well and I've dealt yeah. with it and loads. I, know, I know you talk about it yeah yeah, well. yeah yeah always talk about it because I think and also I remember actually one of the first people I ever told about it ever was Hugo Taylor your husband um and I was like 22 years old and I just kept saying to him do you ever feel nervous do you ever feel like nervous yeah. all the time and he was like, no, I don't. He really, he, he literally like never gets anxiety. He doesn't, he understands a lot more about it now, but he doesn't, he doesn't personally feel, feel it. Feel it. Oh my God. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. It's horrible. It's the worst thing. So I had it then and mine sort of manifests from panic attacks. Talk to you about your anxiety. What, when did it kick in? When did it happen? Um, oh God. How yeah, long, yeah, here how, we go. How long you Listen, got? I'm just going to sit back and as you're going to tell, open up. This is, it's just like no, a real I'm, session. I'm, I think it's so good to talk about it because it can feel so 
alienating and horrible when you're suffering with it. And mm. um, I think, you know, the more we talk about it, the more we help to end the stigma around it and make people feel like less alone. Yeah. So I'm always happy to talk about it. Um, I think it's a long journey. I think it's something that I've been unpicking a lot in therapy and it goes back to childhood stuff. It goes back to going being sent to boarding school when I was super young, mm. feelings of abandonment. Oh, being, hey, snap. Then being, I went to boarding school when I was nine. Yeah, I was eight. I beat um, you. Being, <laughs> um, being uh, bullied. Uh, sorry, oh, something to laugh about. Being bullied. Were you bullied? But, yeah, quite badly in my teen and teenage years between the age of probably 12 to probably the end of school. I did not know that. Yeah. Hang on a second. Okay, I just let's break the. You were you went through bullying. Yep. What kind of bullying? Like really mean bullying from girls. Really. But, yeah. What about? Like they would pick on how I looked and just you know like mean stuff, and then also from guys. Like when I went to mixed school, and you know you kind of have that kind of slut shaming and like the kind really? of meanness that can come from. Uh, yeah, from I've, I experienced it really badly with girls and thought if I go to a mixed school, it will be better. Yeah. Then, you know, being at all girls school and then going into like a mixed environment, not really knowing how to be around boys, also having like low self-esteem from being bullied, then sort of probably hooking up with like loads of different guys to try and get that validation and, you know, thought that would like help make me feel better. But then you end up getting really picked on because of that. So... It was kind of a vicious cycle. That, God, yeah, man. it was quite bad. So I, so I started having panic attacks um, from, from kind of around the time when I left school. Really? So yeah. 18 years old? I actually, no, I probably started having panic attacks slightly younger than that, but I didn't know, or at least having severe moments of anxiety, but I didn't know how to label it. I didn't know what it was. What did it feel like at the time? It felt like being intensely uncomfortable and wanting to run away. And, and, I, and I also manifested in like, I would get a lot of stomach issues. I could get a lot of like stomach cramps and pain. Obviously, it's, IBS is really linked with anxiety and, you know, you can feel it really in your stomach as mm. well. When If you're having those nervous feelings, it often you can feel it in different parts of your body. That's really funny. I didn't I didn't realize that because actually that's a good thing. I, I, I've always had IBS ever since I was a kid. Yeah. And I thought it's that was... IBS and anxiety like go hand in hand. It like feeds each other. Because my bowels, it's like, it's like honestly like like the moon. If I'm anxious, they're bad. Yeah, because the serotonin, serotonin is made in your gut. Yeah, I know this. So it's, so it's the, the link between the, the gut, your gut and your brain is massive. This is, this is really interesting because that basically is like a warning sign that it can yeah. be. So if your stomach is starting to be bad and you're starting to... You've got to listen to your body for sure. Oh my god! That's I think the way I'm like look at anxiety now is it's a, it's a warning sign. It's your body giving you a warning mm. and saying, "Hey, listen up! Like you need to change something." Mm. So now, when I do have moments of anxiety, I actually had a panic attack uh, on a plane about ten days ago, which was quite bad. What? And I am a nervous flyer. It wasn't there. There was normally if there's turbulence, I tend to like have a panic attack, and there wasn't even any turbulence. And I was on a plane with my kids and thought. I literally thought I started, I was going to suffocate and like couldn't breathe. And like, luckily I wasn't on my own with the kids, but I was properly for about an hour, thought they were going to have to like land the plane and I was going to die. It was like really, a really scary place to be. A panic attack is different for lots, for lots of people, right? And, but, but typically what it is is where you feel like you're dying. You feel like you're having a heart attack, you're suffocating, you can't breathe. You're you blacking out, you need yeah. to escape, you need yeah. to get out. It's horrendous. I've only ever had a sort of two ever in my life when I was much younger. Okay. And holy smokes, they're, they're, they're pretty horrendous. And you were having those when you were 17, 18 and not being able to explain it. That's awful. Yeah, I just didn't, I, I didn't know, like, I didn't, the word anxiety, it wasn't that widely used. Mm. I mean, I was diagnosed with depression when I was at school. Um, and then I guess, the you know, anxiety and depression go like quite hand in hand. You felt low at school? Yeah, like from the bullying. But then when I left school, I feel like the depression kind of lifted I felt like happier because I just hated being at school and be when I was out like left the school environment I wasn't didn't have to like see my bullies on a daily basis I was I felt happier moved to London and then we all like started partying a lot right mm. and like like <laughs> drinking and partying basically it it's, not a good combo. Not, it's not a good combo yeah, let's see how health. long we can stay up <laughs> yeah. yeah well you stayed up all night you're wicked <laughs> It's like, what? That's a what is sleep? Who needs sleep anyway? Where you had an hour's sleep? You're cool. It's like, yeah, what why don't you go to work today? You'll feel fine. That's a good idea. Have three coffees. Perfect. 
It's just nuts. And and I think we were in that sort of generation, which I think has changed a little bit because I think people now are more conscious of stuff and more understanding of different things. But we were definitely in that phase of like drinking and going out and doing whatever, being the craziest you can be. That was what cool was. Well, that was just how we socialized. Totally. We would go out on like a Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night. Oh, mm. Thursday night was a big thing. Yeah. There was like a different like place we would all go. Or then there was that one club we would all go to a lot. Which was that one? Public. Oh my God. Public, oh. which was in like in sort of Kings Road, Fulham area. And I used to turn up there by myself because I knew there would be people in there. And we were yeah. there the whole time. Yeah. It, it was it was crazy, but I just want to take that back a bit. I, so you had this horrible experience at school because for my um, the Millie Macintosh that I knew mm. was was cool, was fun, was exciting, was all these different things. But in fact, underneath it all, you were covering up all of these different insecurities yeah. and having a horrendous time. Yeah, I had no clue about that. I don't think anyone would know about that. I think it was something I didn't talk about till like much later. It was something I felt like. Shame by. I, yeah, like it was embarrassing and that, you know, that I had been bullied or was going through it. I'd say by the time we met, I'd probably been already come out the, like come out the other side from quite a lot of it. It was probably when I first went to that school when I was about 12 that it was, that it was its worst. But the scars from that have had like a, you know, a much longer effect because it really damages your self-esteem. It really, you know, damages like, how you see yourself, your self-worth. Like I definitely, you know, I didn't like, there was no self-love there. And it's taken like, taken me a long time and and have, I've had to do quite a lot of therapy. I'm still doing therapy um, mm. to try to help with my mental health now. I definitely feel like I've got a much better understanding. But um, going back to just talking about not drinking, I feel like um, I really needed to just stop drinking alcohol in order to work on my relationship with myself. Mm. and it's just given me so much clarity. It's like I can see clearer, I've got a better connection with myself. I feel like I've got a better connection in my relationship with my husband, with my friends. You feel better, you look better, everything like that, right? I feel right? better. I feel like I'm a much better mom. I feel like I'm more present with my children. Yeah. Um, it's like you notice those like small moments and the things that are really important. Mm. Um, I've always yeah. juggled with it. Yeah. 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 Do, do, I got <laughs> like, yeah, I want to know from you, from your yeah. like, point of view as well, as well, like how do you cope with your anxiety and like what, like, well, how do you manage it? It's funny. So my anxiety, um, I thought I'd, I'd like, I thought I'd conquered it. Okay. Tell me how. <laughs> I was like that old thing. Get out of here. Yeah. What? I had it real bad. Um, I doing main and Chelsea nailed me like that, that crippled me yeah and I've spoken about this before and it really just it, it like took its toll on me and reality tv for lots of reasons is very very heavy in the soul on the soul I want to get into with you right and then I did it for like 10 years I did it for two yeah you just kept on going oh and yeah going. persistent it's like, it's like how is Jamie still on that show like everyone yeah, yeah. else is like <laughs> is that guy old like what's he doing what's They're like he 10 doing? years younger than <laughs> I saw a little stat the other day I've done, I think it is, I did 250 episodes. And the person below me did 180. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So, so That's I, pretty impressive. So I did a lot of episodes. But um, that happened to me. I then stopped doing the show and it, it, it got better. Everything got better. Really? Yeah, everything got better. Um, and I then met Sophie. And actually, weirdly, at the beginning of my relationship with Sophie, the anxiety sort of came back. Because okay. I think what happened was is that um, I met this person who was so great and so wonderful and I was so anxious they were going to leave. Yeah. Like, I was like, oh my God, they're going to go. So my anxiety came back and I couldn't place it. And then when I became more comfortable with Sophie and the relationship and things like that, it went for ages and it and it, and it kind of cleared and it just, it went, it, it went. It was unbelievable. It just went. And, and I learned to, my thing, which was is that I learned to accept it. Which That's is a big part of it. Total big yeah. part of it, right? You suddenly accept it. But recently, because of the wedding, it's come back with crashing force. Yeah, that's understandable. It's it's so much pressure. Yeah. I and know. It, and like stress, you know, you were saying, how do you cope with stress? It's like, it is like the number one anxiety trigger. But I did that thing. I did it uh, beginning of the year. So New Year's, I was having a bit of a tricky time. And I did, maybe the wedding, all that kind of stuff. And I sat in a room in the dark, like in the, not in the dark, I sat in the room by myself. And I really thought about like, okay, what in my life is like sometimes a struggle. And for me, I've, I've always gone back to the same thing is that, you know, in my twenties, I drank way too much. We all did. We drank so yeah. much. And actually I, I've never given up drinking for more than a period of like a month since I was like 18 yeah. years old. 
And actually having that period of where you have that break for like three months is an amazing thing. And the fact that you feel so much better, right? Having not done it is amazing. Yeah. So what's the longest you've done? A month. I reckon one month. month. Yeah. I haven't done any longer than that. Like, a lot of people do that like dry January or yeah. like there's different months. Sometimes there's like a charity th- initiative behind it. Where people give up for a month. Um, and I think it is a really great What was your turning point that you were like, okay, right, I'm going to stop doing this? Uh, it was it was actually after a panic attack that I had um, last summer, um, which was which was when I was hungover. Yeah, and I know I wouldn't have had that panic attack if I hadn't. It was like like when I'm hungover, I get I get such anxiety. Yeah, but what about about what you said the night I, before? What you no, did? It wasn't it wasn't even to do with it, I hadn't even been like you know that drunk that I couldn't remember going to bed or anything. I hadn't been drinking even that heavily but I just know I wouldn't have had that panic attack if I hadn't been drinking the night before the night before that we were on holiday Mm. um I think it was a slight loss of control situation as well because we were away from the kids and we were on a boat um and I knew I like couldn't get to them easily I I just but I just had this really severe panic attack it was a bit like the one I had um on a flight uh like 10 days yeah 10 days ago and that's intense, it was, Millie. It was really, it was really intense, and I was like, "Okay, what?" I went for a hike with Hugo, and I was like, "Right, like what?" He was like, "What? Like we, something? You need to make some kind of change in your life." Because I just, he was like, "You can't. I don't want to see you feel like this again." And I was like, "I never want to feel like this again." Mm. Um, and we went for this hike, and just you know, I like I was like talking everything through, and I was like, "I think I just, you know, just give it a try and just stop drinking." Mm. And just I wasn't even drinking that often. Mm. But I really noticed, especially as I've got older, the, that anxiety would like hang around for a couple of days. So say if you drink like a few drinks once a week, but then you have anxiety for like three or four days after. Yeah, so yeah. It's more than like half so, like, What week. is the point? What is the point? So I was like, yeah. this is, the cost is too great. It's just like, yes, it's fun to have a few glasses of wine, unwind, like enjoy that with friends or with Hugo or whatever. Like that's... For most people, that's fine. But if it if it if if the cost is too great, it's just not worth it. Mm. So I was like, I'm just going to give alcohol-free life a try. And that was uh, like the, towards the end of August last year. Amazing. And every week I felt better. And then I, I knew quite, I'd say within, within a month or two, I knew it wasn't just like a let's just do this for a few weeks. Give me a radar on it. So, okay, I want to... I don't think I'll drink again. Do you really not think yeah. so? But give me a radar in terms of like how you're feeling now compared to then. Like, I know you've had this panic so attack. I had the panic days. attack on the plane, but then I associate that more with, I'm a nervous flyer. It was sure, a high pressure turbulence. situation. I had the kids. I was freaking out. Like, what if something goes down on the plane and I'm with my children? And my brain was like running away. And I, looking at it in the therapy session this morning, was like, I was super overtired from the week before. I had the stress of organizing the trip and everything. So that was like, now I can actually understand why that happened. But overall, since I stopped drinking, I would say I'm like 90% less anxious. What? Yeah. I was was actually on, I was, and I've talked about this on my podcast. I'm not like, I don't shy away from it. I was on medication for my anxiety, for my anxiety. I've actually never said that. During lockdown, I had like, it was just, it was just on the bear. This is when I was with Sophie and things like that. And this doctor's it's nothing to be ashamed about like well i, mean, I know it isn't but it i think it feels like hard to say i was found it really hard to talk about it but then yeah found it actually really like freeing to say it yeah it, i thought it for some reason and a doc said to me just just take this you yeah. should take this you're 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 There's finding no it uncontrollable like if it gets to a point where you where you're really finding it hard to cope in your day-to-day life mm. then yes you can do therapy and all these other things that can help but sometimes you just need someone to throw you a rope so you can like climb out of the hole do you know what? it's so funny so i someone this doctor said to me you should try it and i took the uh took the medication i got it and took the medication and i felt like this immediate shame for some reason that i was taking this thing i was like yeah and that is so much shame it's bizarre it. right and so i i stopped taking it because i was embarrassed that i was taking this medication that was not only going to help me was going to sort yeah. myself give me clarity of thinking and sometimes you just need these helping hands and i don't understand why we and look it's the it's the same thing there's a stigma around it. but it really is there's a shame around taking these and i can see when i asked you about yeah. it you suddenly felt a little bit uncomfy because you're like yeah. oh do i really want to yeah. talk about this but why should you take vitamins in the morning right yeah exactly what's exactly. the difference it's just like but also if you needed to take medication because you had epilepsy or diabetes, 
and you had something that was an unbalance and you needed that medication to just cope in your day to day life, no one, you wouldn't feel weird or guilty about that. So mm. you have to, I think it's thinking about your mental health as your health in general. And if, you know, if you need medication to help with your health, then, then take the medication. But 100%. for me, after a while, there are side effects that affect everyone gets different side effects what were and your side effects I, after a while the reason i came off it well, i was like loving not feeling anxious but i started to feel very numb like i couldn't have emotionally a, yeah wow okay so i but also because I, I felt like I, i'd stopped drinking a few months before and i was like Do you know what i feel so good i just i don't think i actually need the medication anymore so i, you, I came off it slowly yeah. this was over christmas it came off of the medication, and so like since January, I haven't been on it. And how insane is that? Is that like just taking I, like, one felt, thing out of your life? Yeah, alcohol, and then and and just continued. You know, I have a healthy lifestyle. Bumped into you at the gym the other morning. Yeah, you were full of beans. You're um, just like I'm about to go into a class. I was like, oh my god, I keep going. Girl. I work out most days. I meditate. Mm. I eat well. I avoid like sugar, which I find really triggers me. Like I, I saw this be... on your podcast. You said that that sugar spikes it up for you sometimes. Yeah. Why do you think sugar does that? Because it's a drug. You think Sorry, it is? Sorry, talking to the person with I love sugar. <laughs> Sugar's great for you. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to go down this road. No, I feet. think we should. Listen, listen. I think my thing with sugar is this, is that look, there, are, there are disadvantages drug. and advantages to sugar. And I think also, as long as you see it as a treat, it's a good thing. But yes, at the same time, it is a drug. 100%. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's not good for some people. Well, look, like when you remove something like alcohol from your life, I think it's a massive step, but it off, it also makes you then look at like everything else in your life. Mm. So like I haven't completely quit caffeine, like I'm a mom, <laughs> come on, like I need yeah. my coffee, but I have a less, mom is the most stressful thing of all. I have less coffee. <laughs> you drink coffee and you're anxious. That is not a good okay, combo. Do you know what? I, like, I only have like one to two a day in the morning. and That is not good. Drinking any sort of <laughs> caffeine million, not good. That's like the immediate spike. I don't okay, I have rules. Okay. What's your rules? So I don't, I try not to have a coffee now for the first hour of the day. Okay. Which I definitely do think makes a difference. Sure. Yeah. And I don't, I just don't, I have like quite weak coffees, like half caffeinated coffee. Okay. And I'll have maybe like two, but that's my max, not after lunch. Did you used to do this thing? Where and if I feel a bit anxious or triggered, I just won't have one. What I find amazing is I'm sure so many people, we had Spencer on the, and we spoke about his sobriety and his journey with that and all these different things. And what's amazing, this, the responses are is that so many people struggle with this idea of giving up alcohol because firstly, life isn't as fun. Um, it's a really scary thought. Like I found it heavy and hard to say and to just like you know how we just talked about medication how it felt like this a bit taboo to say mm. like i found it quite scary to be like oh, i'm not drinking and like have to explain why like i found that difficult and definitely for the first like couple of months it felt like a bit of a, an elephant in the room for me do you think there's a difference i be by the way i've been to some aa meetings before i went when I, yeah i went to them when i was um about 27 28 you find it helpful mm, i didn't i did you know what i didn't because I think that my my things that I was going through were probably a bit, yeah, not just alcohol, or whatever. But um, do you think though that it is potentially is there an is it easier for not easier, but is there less stigma around women giving up drinking than men giving up drinking? Do you think there's this culture of guys going out still, especially in the UK? Let's go down the pub. Let's have a pint. If you're not having a pint, if you ordered an elderflower. As yeah. guys, you think this match probably maybe a bit more. Where I, where sometimes I think that potentially, and I don't know, I'm just I'm just curious, right? Maybe it, with women and their friends, it's much easier to sort of suggest, "Hey, I'm not drinking," because you know, I, there's lots of different variables. Maybe you could pregnancy, uh, hormones, whatever it is. But with guys, there's still this macho attitude. We've got to go to the pub, watch the football, and do it that way. And I think sometimes there, it's it's really tricky for both yeah. sides. But sometimes with guys, I find it's really quite hard. What does Spencer say about it? He doesn't care. He's just like, yeah. he stopped drinking. But that's his attitude, I right? He's very have, kind of like sociopathic. Put yourself first, ultimately. And you're like, you don't have to explain to people. You can yeah. have you can have an excuse if it makes you feel more comfortable. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's no one's business. And you're putting yourself first. Um, your wedding will actually be the, my first like wedding I've, I've been to, apart from actually when I was pregnant. Um, Are you I nervous about that though? That you're gonna... I'm not, I'm so excited actually, because I really feel like I'm going to, get like Place so much more like from it i think i'll be much more present i'll be able to remember it all um remember everyone else's bad behavior which will be very entertaining um <laughs> okay. i i'm a bit the one thing okay, one thing i'm nervous about is 
I don't feel confident dancing. So without <laughs> alcohol, and I think I'm probably a pretty bad dancer, but when normally if I've had a few drinks, I think I'm a pretty good dancer. And I yeah. feel like that's when my moves like come out. Okay. So I just don't know if, I, if I'm going to be like hitting the dance floor. I've spoken to other people that have quit drinking and they've said it takes a while for that to come back. Yeah, of course it does. I so mean, I like just don't. I might not sober. be. I might not be like doing like the world of dancing. But you know, I'm not going to put pressure on myself. I hope. I'm sure the music will be good. I'm just excited. For Everyone's going to be drunk and they're not going to be thinking about yeah, anyone. No else. one else will notice. Right? No one else is going to notice. <laughs> I had a friend called Jimmy who um, went sober for a bit, and he said that he used to when people, his friends, used to come up and they were really drunk and start talking to him. When they were just having a really drunk conversation, he yeah. would just look at them, just walk off, because they would never remember it in the morning. Yeah, be like, do I need to excuse myself in this conversation? No, <laughs> just, just, walk just leave. Just walk off. Did you used to do this thing where you would uh, wake up in the morning and analyze yourself and see how you're feeling? You'd go, you'd wake up, sorry, bang, okay, how am I feeling? Adjusting your body. Do you do that as much anymore? What, like, uh, I would definitely... Am I anxious? Am I this? Am I that? Uh, Check, checking in on your body, because that's always a thing that I think well, when anxious I wake people sometimes up, do. I, I've, I, try, I'm, I love having a good routine. That really works for me mm. um hugo normally gets up and like leaves and goes downstairs at like 6 a.m and i wake up and just sit and do a meditation wow so that's my time to just do a kind of scan of my body how am i feeling mm. check in and that's how i like to try and start my day every day now before the, before I, the kids come running in and before like the that craziness starts wow my kids as well <sighs> yeah <laughs> it's uh you you have two beautiful girls they really are they are so pretty and that's so I, funny I, I i saw um an interesting what you spoke about which is where you spoke about loss of identity you know yeah. when you had kids and i think you you were one of i think one of my first girlfriends to ha maybe have kids or i think maybe you were one of the first yeah and you know i i have nephews and nieces and i, I for me going through like i was so excited to have kids Beyond... Are you still excited? No. <laughs> Why? Because I look around at all of yes. my friends okay. and, and I look around at all of my friends. This is, a, this is the truth. Okay. I'll be very truthful. Yep. Be honest. I think kids are the most amazing and I really want them. And, and Sophie, my wonderful wife, wants them. But I'm nervous because I now look around. When, when you're younger and you think about having kids, you're incredibly naive to everything. Right. I, you're naive to the stress, to the financial problems, to the... Uh, relationship problems to sex with each other to Sorry, intimacy. What, what's that? What, <laughs> you, I think what, it, what is sex? <laughs> yeah, what is sex? Exactly. <laughs> no, no. I think you become a you born again virgin. I'm like, <laughs> I, don't even, I don't think I've heard of that. I have no, no idea. <laughs> exactly. Last time when you have kids, last time you have sex, it's like. <laughs> the last time I had sex, when I got pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I honestly think that's what happens. Yeah, that does happen. Yeah. Sorry. And, and also, that was, you be that was about also that. just get on with it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to get into all these, but so I'm very fearful of that because mm -hmm. I look at a lot of my friends and I, I see how stressed everyone is. Okay. It and that is, worries me. Um, I mean, I think it's good to be realistic about the change because it is the biggest life change you could ever go through. Mm. And it is a shock. But I don't don't let it stop you. Like you figure it out, and yes, it can feel stressful. But it's for me, the positives have massively outweighed that. You know, the tiredness, the stress, the tears, the all the other strains that come with it. I think it's about having um, you know a support network around you, mm -hmm. and you'll have that. And also looking on the more like positive side from what you said, all the people around you already having kids is that is really helpful mm -hmm. because they have already done it, and they will be able to like lend you all the baby stuff and advice and they'll have a network of people that lend help them. Lend you all the baby stuff? For, what baby stuff? For all the things that you might need. They're like, just going to go, it's going to be shit for the next like two like, years. Yeah, get ready for like, it. oh, whenever like, you know, like the girls grow older, there's like, I could have a whole like pile of stuff ready to give to one of my friends that's about to have a baby, you know? So you'll have all the, you'll clean up. You okay, but, but hang on. You said you that you lost your identity. And actually I spoke to an amazing person once. Her name is Michelle Kennedy. Yeah, she's amazing. She's epic. She, she is epic. She is. I actually saw her at New Year's when we we got off at the same flight in Scotland together. But she she's amazing, and she has an, an app called Peanut. Yeah, which is all it's a it's a community for women who feel lonely during pregnancy yeah. or birth or whatever it is, and they connect. She's an amazing person, and she talks about that loneliness that women feel, isolation. But talk, uh, talk me through that. How did you feel when you 
first gave birth? Well, with my first daughter, it was in lockdown as well, which was really difficult. Yeah. Uh, with Sienna, she's now three. Um, it's a shock. Like, you know, your whole life is basically on hold and you're just literally covered in like puke and you've just got this tiny baby that you've, uh, you know, it's your responsibility to like keep them alive. And it's, yeah, it's really, it's quite overwhelming. Did you feel like everything that you were had just disappeared? You were this fun, I remember, outgoing like, you know, person. I think for the women, especially your, but your identity and like the, your body image has changed so much. That's quite hard to look at. Like when you've had a baby and you want to love yourself and you're surrounded by people being like body positivity and, you know, love you, love you no matter what. And you kind of really want to, but I found that really difficult. I was like, didn't recognize myself. I was so, so tired. What so, do you, mean? you know, like when you look in the mirror, you're like, who the hell's that? Yeah, yes. Like Are you serious? And like it had like a C section. Yeah. You know, you're like recovering from surgery. Yeah. You know, you're like trying to figure out breastfeeding. It's there's so much going on and the hormones. Um those the first three months after I had uh Sienna we were really difficult. It's actually insane to think about it, especially with breastfeeding. Because yeah. babies, they do it clamping, isn't that what it's called? They clamp onto the nipple. They latch. Latch. They're like it's some sort of alien. They latch, clamp, latch. They, they clamp. But, but they do, they latch. Like, like they, they latch on like a, a It bot. hurts. It really hurts. A, a man couldn't cope with it, for sure. Get out of here. I can reckon I can. No, like, obviously, you can't Stubbing try. your toe is just... <laughs> no, Jamie, honestly, your nipples are so sensitive. Are they Really? The nipple, there's so many like nerve endings there. Honestly, more pain. Okay, so I had two C-sections and breastfeeding yeah. was way more painful than giving birth. <laughs> really? Yes. I don't know why I'm laughing. Just, yes. <laughs> that is so intense. It's really, it's, it's intense. Do you think you'll have more? Hugo doesn't want any more. But you do. I probably have another one. Really? Three's a lot. But then my, my thoughts are, the, the thing stopping me is just like, is it? Well, obviously, it's Hugo. We're not wanting yeah, another yeah. one. We have to actually have sex. That's we have just... to have sex. So that's stopping me. But also, just just slip him some Viagra okay. or something like that. Get him real horny. Light some candles. About can I cope with the third? Like, can my mental health cope with yeah, the third? I know. Like that balance of it's, it's like I just travelled with two of them. It was hell on a flight. <laughs> Imagine with another one. Like, it can I honestly just? But then, it could it be any harder? I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, think it's at some its people peak are like, if hardness. you've already got two, just throw another one in the mix. You won't even notice. But they get another one. And I, imagine if you come up with a quad. I think you would notice. <laughs> <laughs> I think you get more relaxed each child you have. I mean, obviously, like Vogue and Spencer now have three. Oh my god! I've got a friend with four kids and another friend. Yeah, like that. Another friend that's got three now. Like it is amazing seeing like families expand. But I just don't think I have much room in my life for anything else. I get that. Okay, listen, I'm going to start there for part okay. one. We're going to come back in part two where I want to talk about you and Hugo. I want to talk about marriage. I want to talk about Made in Chelsea. I want to talk about loads of different things. You ready for it? And we're okay. going to talk about sex. Okay, I, I mean, I don't even know how much I have to say on the topic. All right. We'll see you in part two, everybody. Bye. Hello everyone, welcome back to part two of Private Parts. Um, still here with Millie McIntosh or Millie Taylor. What do you go by? McIntosh. You go, okay, all right, boss. <laughs> oh, all right. My married name is Taylor, but I, don't, I, I didn't change my name. You didn't change your name? No. I don't think Sophie's going to change her name. Really? I don't know. Sophie Habu, she, I don't think she's going to change it. She's changed it legally. Yeah. But I think she's going to keep the Habu name. I haven't even changed it legally. Have you not? No. What? All right. <laughs> So your actual name is... But it says a lot of paperwork. What? Like, That's I have just done lazy. It, I've done it all before. <laughs> After the first fourth, I was like, I'm not doing it again. It's too much admin. So... <laughs> Sorry, you go. Oh, you, know, um, you don't like talking about the first divorce. No, but... we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> okay. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. What do you I'm want to talk sure. about? That? No, I'm kidding. I, I do want to know this. Oh, well, you're, you're married now. I'm married now. How's it feel? It's great. I love it. How was your wedding? Yeah, it was. Um, the, the ceremony was amazing. It was just a small little thing. Just did to you do, do it the, at Chelsea Town Hall? Chelsea Town Hall. Yeah, I did the same with Hugo a few days before we did our like big celebration. Yeah, just to do the paperwork. It was great. But it's just like 
nice having that small group setting and then yeah. you do like a lunch afterwards then we did a lunch after and it was so fun and it I, I just feel like a sense of like calm it's just like i think before when you're in a relationship you're like you almost like it's 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 a it's sort of a constant there's there's constant fear that the other person could go when you're married okay. it's like well i've trapped you with a contract yeah 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 you're gonna have to divorce <laughs> me and that's gonna take ages so you want to go through that oh my god and actually in your head you just think oh she can't be bothered she's gonna stick with it how do you keep, um, how long have you been with Hugo for? So we've been together about seven years okay. and we've been married for, it'll be five years in June. Amazing. How do you keep the relationship alive? Give it to me. This is the, the tips that I need. Um, it's a bit different when you've had kids. Okay. But what, before, like before you have children, I would just really recommend just travel as much as you can together. Everyone says that. Yeah. It's so much, it's just so much harder when you've got kids. You're either... Travel with them, which is not a holiday. It's yeah. just parenting in a different country, which is harder. Or, and it's quite stressful. Sounds really um, stressful. Or you leave them behind and then you constantly miss them and feel like guilty that you're not with them. And just and you've got to arrange all the like, who's looking after them when you're not there. And it's it's hard. And okay. You don't want to, you, you say you'll, you'll, you say that you'll go away and leave them and then you have them and you don't want to leave them. Yeah. And if you do, it's for like one night and you go to like, the countryside it's not like yeah that's what you you're do. not off somewhere like really exotic <laughs> um so that's why i would say make the most of like doing things like anything that you really want to do just the two of you anywhere you want to go that's like a long distance long haul just go and go and visit those places do like an extended honeymoon i mean you go to two honeymoons we did one straight after the wedding and then we did one like six months later where did you go to both of those so straight after the wedding we went to greece yeah and did like two uh, islands in Greece and then later in the year like in the winter we went and did Oman and then the Maldives Oman's pretty cool and that was amazing do you do the six senses yeah yeah it's amazing yeah oh my god okay we're doing Panama Sophie's okay. not that excited about it <laughs> she doesn't want to go to Panama but we're gonna see the whales and like go like hiking she's like I don't want to do that I want that to sounds see fun sounds wicked yeah. I know and I did this whole surprise for her I think she's kind of excited about it um you and Hugo though that story is amazing because we were all like friends before, and then we started doing MIC, and you guys... We'd already like had a bit of history. You had a bit of a bling. Yeah, well, we'd, we'd like hooked up a couple of times in the, over the, in the couple of years before Made in Chelsea. We always like yeah. had that chemistry. Uh -huh. And then, yeah, well, we were together for like four months when... Really? Yeah. I feel like we it was were, longer than that. It was about four months. I was properly in love with him. You were? Yeah. So how many times in your life have you been in love, do you think? Probably twice. Only twice? Yeah. Properly in love. Mm -hmm. Okay, and first time was Voldemort. We don't talk about it. I, uh, I, I couldn't <laughs> possibly say. Okay, I'm just guessing, right? I'm just and guessing. No comment. Okay, I'm guessing. And then, so you were never in love when you were younger, teen years? You were no. Are you serious? Yeah. So I you, never had like a... You never had your heart broken properly? Not you've had no. you've had upsetness, yeah, I get it. But, but like, no, I didn't have a boyfriend. Like when I was in my in my teens. So who was your first kiss? I can't. I actually can't remember his name. <laughs> you, can't, you can't remember his name. I don't, was it like a? Was it one of? The, I actually think it was with a boy. That I was. I actually think it was with your school. Was it? Yeah. It was at Radley. It was a social, but it was at my school, and I can't. Oh I don't. I don't, I don't remember his name. We met on the dance floor and we kissed. I was twelve. Really? Yeah. Jesus, it was fun. Can you remember though. who your first kiss yeah, was? Yeah, I can remember. Morvan. No, it wasn't Morvan. <laughs> what was it? You can't remember. It was Tash. Tash? Do you know, this is actually a funny story. Okay. <laughs> I guess someone called Tash. She, she may listen to it, she may not. But I guess I called Tash on this boat. And I then decided what would be a funny idea for a podcast is to find the first person I ever kissed. Oh. So I managed to track down this person, Tash. I sent her a message saying... On Instagram. On, yeah, like, I think LinkedIn. Like saying, hey, Tash, I'd love to chat to you about my first kiss. Da, da, da. She didn't reply. Managed to get hold of her number. And so I phoned her. I said, hey, Tash, it's Jamie. She said, don't call this number again. <laughs> Hung up. I was well, like, what? I thought well, it would be she a might not want, want to talk about it. It's a kiss. I thought it would be exciting, you know. Um, so you and Hugo dated for a bit. And you loved him. You probably loved him. Why didn't you guys then connect back then? What happened? Oh, well, I mean, I don't want to go like too much back through old show history, babe, but like... Okay. I think you know what happened. Oh. 
Didn't I, end I that forgot well. About yeah, that. didn't end that well. Wow. But we were like, we were young, like you know, it was we he we both changed a lot in the years after that. Oh my god, yeah. But you know, we've like we've known each other for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Um, literally for like over half my life because I think I met him when I was about fifteen. Yeah. Uh, 15, 16, and, you know, we weren't in the right place to be together then. Like, we, you know, we had that short relationship. It wasn't very equal. I think I was probably more into him than he was into me. Mm -hmm. And then, see, we broke up. I went, we were both in in relationships with other people. Mm -hmm. We didn't speak for years. Mm -hmm. What was that moment when you reconnected? It was like we st- we we started speaking again as friends after seeing each other at a friend's wedding. Okay. And it was just quite nice to have that person like back in my life that was like so familiar that I knew. Yeah. And um, he'd just been through quite a bad breakup. I was going through a bad breakup and we would just like speak as friends. And then it, that just developed into something romantic. And then the rest is history. When you, when you first hooked up again, was it electric? It was like teenagers again. Yeah. Yeah. It's unbelievable, isn't it? When when <laughs> when, when when there's so much like you've elect- had that like yeah. yeah. When there because also weirdly I've said this before, but when I Sophie and I were friends. Okay. And then <laughs> How did you get together with Sophie? Also, no, no, she's, no. she is a catch can i just she's say she's such a catch yeah. we uh, the first uh, sophie and i were friends and then um we went to south africa like just we, friends we were just really really good friends i felt awkward around her a lot of the time i was like why do i feel awkward i didn't really know it's because i obviously fancied her or something and then when we went to south africa together on this trip she walked out in a bikini and i was like my god she's a she's a chick She's hot. But, yeah. Yeah, but I hadn't, I hadn't noticed it because she was my friend. Okay. And then we shared a bed together. And I remember one night she rolled over. She was wearing a thong. And, and I was suddenly so like, I was like, oh my God. I couldn't, couldn't believe it. I was like so turned on. And I was like, okay, I must really fancy her. And then when we first hooked up, it was like the most electric thing because I think it was like friendship and this and that yeah. and all coming down. So you when, must have the same thing with Hugo. When right? you've got the friendship, like at the basis of like the base of the relationship, mm. I think it just goes so much deeper. Mm. And like we we are like best friends now, and it, that is an amazing thing to have when you're parenting, and that can be difficult. But I feel like we've got that foundation, and so it is like teamwork, and you could just and do the respect, you know, yeah the respect for each other right yeah you know it, it's funny with mic right i don't want to go back into the old show but you only did that for two years but still people would go millie mic to let's say with jamie and mic but things like that but still people remember you on that is that annoying for you or not annoying what do you think i mean i meet people all the time like who i mean not every day but definitely like every week i would say out and about someone will come up to me and be like millie i loved you on the show or yeah. People, people always say to me, they're like, I loved it when you had when you slapped Spencer. I'm like, oh god, definitely don't. That I don't condone. So I, don't, I don't condone violence at all. I love um, it that, that you was, have to say that. I, I love do. it. Why do you have to say that? Because you, it's I not mean, violence. It's well, just, look, you slapped some bellend who was being annoying. He was not acting in a very nice way. I was standing up for my friend. In my defense, um, it's actually one of the most iconic. But I think because I television had scenes ever. quite a lot of these like these moments that were not scripted they weren't you know it was it was very real Mm. there were things that I went through on camera that were very painful for me um I didn't shy away from that and I think that people connect with that because they were like real moments that they might have gone through or they might have experienced something similar that kind of heartbreak or betrayal or you know that whether it's with a boyfriend or with a friend and I think that's why uh, people, people, remember people, it. people remember it. So I never look back on the show with any resentment or, you know, I don't get annoyed that people bring it up because I think there's no point like fighting it. Like, yes, I am known from this reality show and like what an amazing thing to be a part of. I love that. Yeah. And like, I'm the same as you. What right? a great platform. Someone said to me once, like, do you feel like they exploited you? And I was like, no more than I exploited them right back. Because it was a business from the beginning. Yeah, it, it, it was a platform, and it it's what platform. you do with it. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, I think I spoke to Cags about this, but what was your how? Because you, you were the original. You, you, yeah. were, you were one of the absolute originals. Were you not? No, I was season two. 
I just, um, I, I just rocked you're in. Late arrival. Yo, late arrival, baby. And I rocked in. Hey, how you doing, everyone? <laughs> just thinking I was an absolute boss. <laughs> just wasn't. Oh, my God. It was honestly, also, I didn't get the show for like a year. I was like, wait, so it's like, what, we have to do like this? What, you want me to, what do you want me to talk about? What? Like, yeah, what do you want what? me to talk? I remember they said you should kiss Louise in the scene. And I was like, really? Like, <laughs> What is it? She doesn't want to. She's like, oh no, she will. It's like, how do you know she does? <laughs> I just didn't get the concept of it. But how were you approached at the very beginning? Did someone just basically say, how did it happen with you? So they were actually interviewing my flatmate. Yeah. Who didn't end up doing the show. Um, one of my old school, older school friends. Who was that? Do I know? You don't know her that I live with at the time. And you know how they, when they were looking for the cast of the show, they had their like key people. I think it was like Rosie, Spencer, Hugo, maybe Francis. Francis they were maybe, like already yeah. involved. Yeah. And then they looked at like everyone else they knew and like researched all of their friends on Facebook and that kind of thing. So they would have all these other names that they were like linked to these people and they wanted to meet them mm. to see if they'd be like good on the show. And was, my friend was being interviewed and I ran in the room, didn't know what she was, that she was being interviewed. And I had like one thigh high boot on and one like high heel. I was in my underwear and I was like, I'm going on a date. Which boot, is, which shoe is better? And the producer was like who are you basically and was like you need to see the show so wait hang on so you were in your underwear yeah with a thigh <laughs> high boot on and I'm a on heel the, on and a heel on and you run in front of the camera the, it, it, they, yeah and, and they was, went who and are I, you and I was like <laughs> you know I'm going on a date which shoe is like you know the best look with like which what I was gonna wear and yeah the producer was just like okay you look fun, like let's let's get you. You look fun. <laughs> let's get you. you Probably look, you look like trouble. Yeah, yeah, you look fun. We'd love to have you. Yeah, and I was like, no, 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 I'm good. I was already in the process of I wanted to be on Britain and Ireland's Next Top Model. Did you? And I was like, I remember this. Potentially wanted going to do that show. Yeah. And then when I didn't get in, I got through to like nearly the final round when you make it into the show, and then I didn't get in. Mm. And I was like, okay, maybe this could be like a good opportunity. So, and I'm so glad that it worked out that way. Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. But it's a, it's a funny thing to choose to do. Reality TV is yeah. like, it's because you're, you're going into something and there's no briefing on it. But we, when we signed up to it, it was probably different because you joined season two. Yeah. When we signed up for the show, it didn't have a, a name. What it was had a name? working title, which was Chelsea Girls. Was that what it was? Yeah. So it wasn't, it didn't even have a name. Okay. I remember looking at this contract, showing it to my parents. They were like, they literally thought some random one guy would be like following me around with a video camera. They didn't understand. <laughs> it was quite a hard thing to like explain. All we had. No, it's going to be really cool. All we, we like, had for be... reference was Towie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the only thing. All, yeah. All the hills or something like that, yeah, right? Yeah, but in the UK. Uh-huh. And, and did you, when you had to do... But you, you, you went to like a duck to water. You were just complete natural with it. You were totally fine. I feel like you were. I mean, it was, it was, um, it was kind of weird and and fun, but also like there were, you know, the days were long. There was a lot of sitting around and like mm. the pretend party scenes and stuff. They were. I remember hating that when you had to like. I couldn't believe my luck doing it. Did you just love all of it? At the beginning, yeah, and towards the end, I, and I, I'm so proud of it. Like I'm, you know, that's my history and things like that. Yeah, I loved it. I couldn't believe that. It was fun. We got to travel and go on these like fun trips. And yeah, it was, it was kind of like exciting. And like we were like 21. What else were we going to be doing? But but hang on. But the interesting thing with you is that you left after two years. Yeah. That is risky. That is um, uh, interesting. That is kind of um, uh, forward thinking as well. I I started a, a relationship with somebody that wasn't going to be in the show. Mm -hmm. And then I felt like well, because they couldn't film that side of my life that I was just and like Kagi left and she was really like my best friend in the show. Yeah. Um. And I felt like the what I was get being asked to film was like things that weren't that like genuine to me. I didn't really feel like I had such a like storyline for them to follow. Mm. And I didn't want to just be in there like creating drama for like other people. But that, that so it kind of I, it's I brave always of said you, I like always it. said I would leave when it just felt like it wasn't. And it wasn't fun. It wasn't anymore. authentic. It wasn't authentic, and that is one. So that's why I left. That, but it's amazing because you leave at something like that. So, so early, and I said, "Well, people still remember you from it." But I feel like when you first left, you definitely had this idea that you're like, "I don't want to be associated." A lot of people had that. I think everyone pretty much had that. I don't want to be associated with this anymore because it was like, okay, we're seen for being posh and 
you know, all these different things and living off our parents' money and all this different stuff. It's like, well, that's actually not quite the case. And I want to change that narrative a little bit. Do you had that right for a bit or no? Yeah, I think that. And also, you know, it makes a good headline, doesn't it? And, yeah. you know, we've both got like family histories, like mine's with like Quality Street. And so I think we, I've got, I definitely had this like heiress thing that's mm. like followed me around that. Like, and it's and it's not true at all. Well, why is that not true? Because like I'm not an heiress to like anything. Like my family sold Quality Street um, a long time before I was born, so it's just not it's not true. People are like, oh, I've just bought some Quality Street, like you know, coin in your trust fund bank. Yeah, it's so funny, <laughs> and and also, so you get the stigma of being this billionaire child, yeah. but with no money. And it's, it's the same as me is that people think I'm heir to this McVitie's fortune, yeah. and you have to constantly explain. Hang on, this was sold in my family years ago, and we see no, no benefit from that. It's just you know our grandfather or I mean, whatever. I'm proud of the heritage of it for sure, hundred yeah. percent. But you don't get to see the the, the money side yeah. of it, right? So so you left because of who you were dating, and then you left kind of that. Did you miss it at all? Did you miss that world of television? I don't think so. I mean, I went on and did a couple of other like reality projects. I know you've done quite a few other shows mm. as well. Um, there is obviously like a buzz to it, you know, that adrenaline and the, you know, being on camera. I'm, but I, I've kind of adjusted into what I do now where um, I create content. I'm still behind a lens. It's just, you know, it's much more my own. I'm much more in control of it. Talk to me about your podcast because you've started your podcast. You're I have on, a podcast. You have a podcast. Give us the title. Give us the name. Give us something it's about. And you're starting series three now. So series three is currently airing. Okay. And I just really wanted to create this safe space where you could just have these much more like in depth, real, honest, you know, chats. We're not having to hold anything back. You know, on social media, there's only so much space to actually have these conversations and you literally only have a certain amount of characters you can type or a certain amount of length that you can mm. speak for. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like, I feel like I started being um, much more open on social media um, from when I was pregnant with my first daughter about three years ago about talking much more about my mental health and how I was feeling. Having a podcast is just a perfect place to have those discussions. Why do you think you were closed before that? Why do you think you didn't open up that because 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 i think you're you are you're really authentic to yourself the reason why you didn't do made in chelsea is because you were like right i'm not being authentic anymore for me i i i could act yeah you know, i can't act i i i i, <laughs> I can and i did it for a long time right i could yeah. play play different roles yeah. and things like that and and so being really authentic is is about sharing stuff but you found that difficult to share why would you find things difficult I to share? i think but also the way that we were all using social media a couple of years ago it was more just like post a picture and, and, you know, uh, a yeah. three-word caption. It wasn't... You know, I, I, I just didn't Live, like laugh, love. The, <laughs> yeah, it's just like, put up a nice picture, put on a nice filter. And, and actually and the caption like, would take longer than the photo. You'd be like, oh, what is this one going to really be? A really short yeah. one-liner of a caption. And that, I don't know, I guess... I just didn't feel like there was that space to to have the, to have those more in-depth chats. Were you nervous about people um, seeing your authentic self in a way? I think, yeah, it definitely felt quite scary when I first uh, first started speaking more openly and shared things, you know, not just the kind of those glossy moments and you start sharing, actually, I'm going through something really difficult. But actually, I found it so rewarding, mm. and I still do, um, when you open up about something painful and you actually get loads of messages from other people going through the same thing, saying that you're not alone, suggesting things that might help, but also saying that hearing what you've said has really helped them. Mm. That's a really good feeling. Do you have that on your podcast where people write in all the time yeah. saying that? That's amazing. And you get to do it with one of your best friends. It's been really good fun doing it with a friend. And uh, it's just great having guests on. I mean, you love podcasting. You're like, literally, <laughs> how many episodes have you done? My God. I've done a podcast once a week for about six years. Wow. For me, I've always learned from like talking to people and understanding that's how I've learned. Reading books and sitting in lessons never really did it for me. But actually sitting and engaging with someone, that's how I learned. So that's why I love it because you learn so many things. And also it's the only platform where you can sit and chat for ages and yeah. people just listen and have a fun time. That's why I love just it It's just enjoyable so much. doing it. It's yeah. Like, and I get what you, I totally get what you mean about learning. And we've had loads of amazing experts on and, you know, you can just sit there and like grill them and interview them. It's quite selfish. I just have loads of people on that I find really interesting. <laughs> yeah, but that's what makes it that good, I right? I want to speak to you and then you just get to basically like interview them. Yeah. It's quite nice being on the other side of that. Do you think you're now in a place where, would you say this is one of the happiest places you've been in for a while? Yeah. Happiest, really? like most stable. Um, 
yeah, I, I really feel like having my, like having the kids and becoming a mom is, uh, is all kind of made me. Really? But yeah. Brings me like so much happiness. Why does it bring you so much joy? Because you feel a real sense of purpose? It's definitely given me a sense of purpose. Um, being a mom has motivated me more than ever to just be the best version of myself to tackle my demons, like mm. just be the best version of me for them. Mm. But in that, I've really discovered a kind of new sense of calm and just new sense of yeah, like purpose and order in my life. Um, I just want to, I just want to seek out joy and just like literally, I don't want to waste like a moment, like doing anything that doesn't bring me joy. Mm. So, so what do you want to still achieve? What is it that you're going, this is what I want to do. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. Here we go. Just really, really think about that hard question at the end of it. I feel like that's such an intense question. It's so intense, but that's, no, a, but I think it's, but it's a good question, right? Because I think actually what we, I don't know, sometimes someone, someone said to me right once that we kind of got to have this destination in life and realize where we're heading. Otherwise we kind of get lost. And actually sometimes I just think to myself, what do I want to achieve? And actually going back to that thing about why I'm nervous about kids. Yeah. Actually, I think it's one of the greatest things to do in life. Because because why are we put on this earth otherwise? If we're put on this earth just to whatever, have fun, with, that can't be right. We're put on this earth, I think, to bring up little ones and be a dad and be a mom and and be a great mom. And, and like you said, bring up two little kids. And, and that's the you, biggest achievement. It makes all these things that you maybe no longer found exciting. Yeah. It brings like a whole new lease of life Amazing. to them, like... Like their birthday is suddenly like so much fun because you get to see how much they enjoy it. Like Christmas is so much fun because of you see it through their eyes. Yeah. What else when they have boyfriends? What are you going to do then? Oh, God. I can't think of that. <laughs> that's I happen. actually don't like to think too far ahead. I, I'm like, it freaks me out. Does it yeah. really? Yes. Why is it freak you out? Because I just don't, I mean, I, it's just going to be a hot, it just constantly changes. We're currently, my brain is currently like potty training and you know, dealing with my three-year-old falling out of the bed. Like, that. I'm, I can't think about boyfriends just yet. God, I think about if I had a son, I'd just be worried about him Being like you? <laughs> just, just wanking in the attic or something. And I'd be like, I, I know what you're doing out there. I, do you know, I am glad I have got girls. I don't want to do all those crusty sheets. <laughs> and I someone wrote in once saying that they're constantly in the battle of finding crusty socks everywhere. <laughs> Hey. That's why I actually am so glad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So good. I mean, listen, I want to say, um, we like we said, we've been friends for so long, dude. And uh, every time I see you, it's 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 like it's exactly normal always. Nothing ever changes. And uh, proud of you for just being the greatest mom. I, you know, I I don't see you that often. But when I see you on like social media and stuff like that, you just you look like you're just being the you ooze wholesomeness. Thank you. And I remember the, and I also, I, I, I remember so my so phoned you once. She was having a little bit of a, like an anxiety thing, and you really helped her as well. And I really appreciate. I always remember oh my that. God, of course. Yeah, like, and I really appreciate time. that. That was so kind. Thank you for coming. Where can we listen to your podcast? Um, so you can listen to it, Mum Lemmers and More, wherever you get your podcasts. And um, you have Instagram and things like that. Uh, so for the Instagram, you can go to Basement Chats. Great, amazing. And uh, also check out all our episodes on YouTube. Okay, I'm going to leave the link in the description below. But I want to say a big thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. Um, hey, listen. Thanks uh, for having me. I'm so excited for your wedding. Oh, my God. I, listen, I know you're not going to be drinking, but I'm going to be lit. Well, I hope so. I'll have to deal with the anxiety after this. Okay, well, I'll be there the next day. <laughs> you can hug me. All right. All right, everybody. Listen, we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Oh, that was